This is how legends are made. Legendary. There are so many legends in this building today. Legendary. <laughs> Well, I want to welcome you to Legendary, the podcast. I'm Kevin Jonas Sr., and today we have a wonderful guest, and that is our friend Mandy Harvey. Mandy, welcome. Well, thank you so much for having me. We're so, so excited to have you. Yeah. It's been a long time. I've known you for a while, and so I think that that's something that surprises a lot of people. We actually have known each other for a while, and um, I've been just kind of tickled with what you're doing here yeah. and having a space where people can have honest conversations and just relax and talk about things that are meaningful to them. It's a, it's a beautiful thing that you're doing. Oh, thank you. Yeah, of course. And I'll use a little sign language. <laughs> I only know a little sign language. Uh, you're not giving yourself enough credit, but I totally understand. Simcom sucks. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, yes. Uh, we have known each other for a while yeah. and had the privilege of supporting you mm. in your career. And I have to be honest, my wife told me that she met you. Yeah. And we'll talk about how she met you. But when she came home from a trip, mm. she said, I met the most amazing, wonderful person. She's deaf and she sings. And I went, impossible. <laughs> and she said, no, no, no. She's deaf and she sings. And I said, still impossible <laughs> and then I was turned and convinced and you have become a part of our life and just uh, so thrilled at your talent I am amazed at what you do but why don't you back us up sure. and we'll start with this journey yeah. um, you started when you were young yeah. singing when did you start singing my mom put me in choir class when I was about four. Um, I was very withdrawn as a child, very awkward, very shy. And Hard because, to believe. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, honestly, there's been so many blessings that have happened from me losing my hearing. I will get into that in a second. But uh, no, when you're hard of hearing, I think especially, I think yeah. it's difficult because you're lip reading. And at, at that age, you don't want to make mistakes because you don't want people to make fun of you. You don't want to... Mm. You don't, you don't want yourself to be displayed. You just kind of want to fall into the background, be normal, quote unquote. And uh, my mom put me in this choir class and it was the first time that I really started to click because I saw the words in black and white. I got to be a part of the conversation and work as a team and it was just like this overwhelming sense of there are places that I can belong. And wow. yeah, it was, it was gorgeous. But shooting through, I, I never ever saw myself being the person that would be on this side of the camera. I, I always wanted to be the quiet right. person in the background to be a teacher and it didn't work out. But uh, it didn't work out in the best ways, I think. Right. Went to school for vocal music education because I wanted to be a teacher. And how old were you when you left for school? Uh, 18. Yeah. And you had been singing from the time Since you were four. four. Yeah, but heavy. Like, I was, I was in. Same. You know? Yeah. I, I started was, when I was, I was seven, in. and music was my life. I think at one point in high school, I was in five different choirs at the same time. Wow. Yeah. I was singing everything from, like, uh, alto to sometimes tenor uh, to support the guys to first or super yeah. soprano and so that I was kind of shifting around depending on the choir just feeling you were good enough to fill in whatever hole was there yeah I was I was that's great I, I had a good enough range um and I learned very quickly right and I studied and in high school you don't get a lot of people who actually study the music you know they they go right. they do their class they go home yeah so and they're list like, they're listening they're not really sight reading right and I loved it. It was everything. So oh, that's great. Were you in musical theater as well? Yeah. Of course. Yeah, awfully. I was awful because I was horribly shy. So you'd get these people in there, or like, hi, and I'd be like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> but I've I've thrown up <coughs> on people. So and that's too funny. Yeah. So you you leave for school. Yeah. You go to college. Yeah. So tell us what happened in college that changed the course of your life. 
I think I actually started um, in, in my senior year of high school. It's when I, I dislocated my leg. I was born with a connective tissue disorder called Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, and so I have a lot of physical barriers and uh, my connections and everything dislocates a lot. And so I was walking. So how does that play out? So like everything like Ooh. goes. So when I wake up in the morning, I have to put my fingers back in place and my shoulders will pop out. So I pop them, pop out, pop back in, pop out, pop back in. It's very easy oh. to shift. And so I was walking and I stepped down wrong and I dislocated the leg. And so we didn't know I had EDS at the time, but there were a lot of flags. Right. But that wasn't something that was popular or thought through mm -hmm. back then. Now it's a little bit more understood, so people look for those red flags and go, hmm. We've seen that with diabetes, uh, yeah. where with us, we were shocked. We didn't really know the clues. I think it's much more well known if you have dramatic weight loss in your child to, to keep an eye out. But yeah. uh, what are some of those warning signs, just in case people are listening? And yeah, have that I mean, issue? the hypermobility mm -hmm. is, a, is a big one for, for my type. Um, a lot of people have issues with um, kind of their blood pressure and their heart rate control. Mm -hmm. um, for me, I, I get I get massive like rhythms changes, but um, thankfully my heart is doing okay. Great. Um, but I didn't respond to medication, so I don't have like receptors mm -hmm. for specific things. So a lot of medications just didn't work for me, and that's a big red flag because um, my body just does not react. It's like giving me water. Right. Um, and, you know, just the elasticity and how I respond to those things. Um, so what happened is I didn't respond to the medication, so they pumped more into me. Oh. And uh, my body freaked out. Yeah, I as, bet. It, as it should have. I think at one point somebody told me that I had more, like, meds in me than an open heart surgery patient on record in Colorado at the time. And I was wow. just like, for a, to put my knee back to place, like right. I would wake up and talk to people in surgery because they were having a really hard time keeping me under because I was eating through the anesthesia. Right. So the um, effects are there, but you're not feeling them the same way. Right. Wow. Right. So I could feel the pressure. I wasn't yeah. in pain. I feel the pressure. And I, they were moving my IV because they saw that I was waking up. And they're like, I don't think it's working. And I was like, why are you, mo why are you moving my IV? <laughs> and when I woke up, fully like woke up, finish, finish, uh, the anesthesiologist was like, you asked me a question. Do you remember? I was like, yeah, you moved my IV and you didn't oh, tell me so why. Funny. And he was sweating. I felt so bad. Wow. But anyway, that started me having multiple surgeries. So I had six major surgeries on my left or my right leg up in within a year and a half. So we're talking a lot of stress, a lot right. of a lot of abuse to my system, mm -hmm. medications, antibiotics, antibiotics for me I, we've had to change because my body reacts to them very poorly. So it's like at the time I was filling myself with drugs that were causing harm. Right. Um, whereas now that we know, we would have never done the process the way that we did it. We would have, we would have done it so differently. But, I'm sure. Yeah. So when was the official diagnosis? Of EDS? Mm -hmm. After. Wow. So it took me losing my hearing for them to figure it out. Because they, they were able to locate what was happening. Because it was one of those things where it was just like, we're going to figure this out. Why did this happen? How did this happen? You know, I was oh. so angry that I was just testing. And uh, I did a, a show and a woman was watching how I was standing and she could see like my, my good leg, um, <laughs> the one I haven't <laughs> had surgeries on yet, <laughs> uh, bends back like 45 degrees in the wrong direction just naturally. Um, and so, so when I'm standing, it goes, and I've been, ma you know, made fun of as a right. child because I stand and I look really odd Be because it's, because it bends this. back the wrong way. Wow. Yeah. And, uh, and she was looking at my hands and my eyes and my face. She was like, have you ever gotten tested for a connective tissue disorder? 
And I've always had like the indicators for having an autoimmune, mm -hmm. but they didn't know exactly what it was. Then I did a bunch of tests and blood work and blah, blah, blah. So I didn't get diagnosed until I think like May 2009, 2010. So it was after, because I lost my hearing 2006. So you lost your hearing 2006. You went three more years before you had your official diagnosis. Yeah. That must have been, okay. So for me, the shock, if, if someone were to come to me and say, especially at that age, yeah, what, 17 to 19? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That you're going to lose your hearing. The, the fear that I would have for my life passion of music, yeah. how did that affect you? Because it's prior to your diagnosis. Yeah, well, I shut down. It, I had a, a very natural response as I had made a mistake of attaching my identity with my dream. Mm -hmm. And so without my dream, I didn't know who I was. And Say so, that again. <laughs> I had made the mistake. I need therapy after that <laughs> statement. Say that one more time. <laughs> oh, I had made the mistake of attaching my identity with my dream. Yeah. And so when my dream died, I didn't know who I was anymore. So um, a lot of people have asked me throughout this journey, you know, you were at college, you started to lose your hearing, why didn't you fight? Why didn't you fight harder? Why didn't you try to stay? And I think people forget like when you're just trying to survive, mm -hmm. um, the fighting is not something that you're thinking about in that moment. Like, That's right. I was trying to breathe. You know I've been there. Yeah. Uh, there, there was a year and a half period through my surgeries, my cancer journey, yeah. that staying alive was an in the moment process. Um, it's hard to describe for people, but I talk about chronic pain with sympathy now. I didn't yeah. understand it before. In fact, I probably was guilty not I'm a, I'm a nice person by nature, right? Yeah. So well, I'm, I'm so we'll tell you to your face. Yeah, I'm, just I'm, I'm nice, <laughs> like to my DNA. Yeah, you're good. But inside, you know, I, I probably judged people who said chronic pain. Sure. And until I dealt with it and every breath I was aware of. Yeah. Any movement I was aware of trying to process what my body was going through. And so I, I understand if anything was added to my process, my survival season, uh, you know, it would have been more than I could have handled on top of just getting through it. At some point, you're just trying to breathe. Yeah. And that takes work. It does. And getting out of bed takes too much work. Yeah. You just like, oh, forget that. I, I can't handle that right now. I don't want to. Because you, you're probably thinking, your, your self-esteem so attached to your dream yeah. and your talent. So there's that yeah. part where, you know, you're created and you are yeah. created to do something. Anything that would limit that or potentially shut it down, uh, there's also the survival of that emotion or yeah. through that emotion. Well, and at the same time, you know, you have things, it's never one thing. Right. It's never just you have cancer, survive, you know, because you also have family that you care for that you don't want to leave you have all of these other pressures and things and right. work and all of these things that layer on top it's never just one thing so it's like when i was losing my hearing it was devastating but i was in i was in fight mode you know of trying to survive so i didn't even i couldn't really like process that information for a while yeah. it's like at that time my body was changing a lot um, my EDS, because of the stress and because of everything that was oh. happening, I was losing a lot of vision. So I went from 0 0.75 to negative 5.75 in nine months for my eyes. Wow. That's a big change. My hearing kept going. And then my body. And that loss was, was improved later? or I did LASIK. Oh, good. So, so I, I, did a, a, I started over. Good. Uh, but that'll probably keep going you know I'll have to get it done again but right. I'm been very fortunate. I'm looking I, I do qualify so I'm looking Ooh. into it myself yeah. it's weird when you first like open your eyes after it's finished finished and you're just like oh, I can see leaves 
on a tree right. down the street. Like it's a, it's, That's it's great. like HD. It's really cool. That's awesome. Yeah. But my, my body, because of all of this stuff and the grief and the anger, mm -hmm. um, I also went through a flare. My body went through a massive flare where everything hurt. And then at the same time, I still had more surgeries. Oh. So I back in a wheelchair at college in a dorm room by myself and just breathing in and out and thinking about, do I really need to take a shower? It's been two weeks. Yeah. 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 It can wait. <laughs> yeah. oh. and, and so, you know, it was, it was a very frustrating uh, time. And when I look back on it, there are so many moments where I was just like, wow. It's amazing what the body can live through. Yeah. Um, Were you trying to sing throughout uh, that? Yeah, a little bit. Uh, I mean, when you're a part of the music program, there are specific classes that if you're not taking them, mm -hmm. you're not going to move forward. And the big one was uh, theory. Yeah. Theory. And so uh, I finished my first semester. So Christmas time, I got fitted for hearing aids. And these were supposed to be like the hope, the thing, the fix, right. um, everything. And a bag of chips and they were like $6,000, $3,000 an ear. And I grew up very not, not affluent. <laughs> <laughs> my, my dad paid for them with his retirement money. Mm -hmm. And it hurt, it hurt me. It, it, I know it didn't hurt him because he's told me to my face, but it still hurts me to this day. Yeah. Um, and that new semester, I was only maybe two months in, and yep. we had dictation. So we had to listen to the piano and chart it out. And without this class, without this test, I'll stop. Ugh. And so I'm sitting there, and I'm waiting. And nothing. And nothing. And I, I had my hearing aids on, and I was ready and I was excited and I was hopeful and and so it's like that was the day everything stopped yeah but when you're having surgeries you need to keep your health insurance so I had to change the class that same day and pick up another class there was no time to process so at that point it stops yeah stop right the music stops yeah your involvement in music stops. Yeah. Uh, how did you process that? I, I didn't for a little while. They let me stay in three classes. They let me stay in piano. Mm -hmm. uh, they let me stay in um, a freshman voice studio, um, knowing that I was not going to continue. And then they let me stay in a concert choir. Um, well, it's, it's really good yeah. that they worked with you. Yeah, they tried. And uh, there, were, there were moments, though, like, that are deep, that cut deep. And I remember being in, in choir, and our conductor was on vacation, so we had the, the, the assistant. Right. And so we had new music, and his way was to have us listen to it over and over and over again so that we could get like kind of familiar with right. the song. And I was sitting there and they played through the song the first time and I was just like devastated, just like Ooh, sitting there shaking because I couldn't keep up. And then the second time through, um, I had the girl next to me, I think it was Laura, um, and she was kind of giving me the beat and moving so she was showing me what was happening so I could try to keep up. And then I got overwhelmed, I got lost. And then the third time through, I asked if I could just go into a practice room. And he was like, no, if you leave, I'm marking you absent for the day. And, and then the fourth time through, I lost it and left. Mm -hmm. And so it's like process, I didn't process. I was angry um, when I left, when I was finished with college that year was over and I moved back home, I still didn't process. I shut down 
because my identity was gone. So right. what do you do? Um, I had to create a new one and that's not something that you do fast. That's right. Um, you had worked on your I had crafted existing that one personality for 19 years. Yeah. And so uh, I started with going to like a community college. Mm -hmm. I worked at Sears. I sold shoes um, to, to pay for it because at the time I was like a size 10 and they didn't have size 10 shoes. So I didn't have any like temptation to buy anything. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I took ASL classes and got involved with the deaf community and understood that my world just changed. It mm -hmm. didn't destroy itself. It was just different. And I found so many examples of incredible people who have a barrier that they don't see as being a significant one to live a life that is meaningful and, and beautiful and productive. And, Wonderful. you know, the, the shock that you had about uh, deaf singers, no, impossible. I've met so many of them. You know, I've met so right. many of them. It's the same. And so it's just like the awareness of it, it's, it's just that. It's, it's not that they're not real. It's that my education of it is so limited. And so it kind of became a passion for me to say, okay, for the next person. Because when I was losing my hearing, I actually met up with Evelyn Glennie. And uh, she was playing, she's amazing and um, beautiful percussionist. She's Scottish, right. she's deaf. Mm -hmm. And she was just telling me, she's like, just keep going. And then she moved on and I was just like, just keep going. <laughs> I, I, and, but I thought about it more and more and more and like, okay. I'll keep I got going. To, I, got to meet, I got to meet somebody who was an example so I could be an example for somebody else. And when we ended up doing a, a performance together many years later. Oh, uh, that's beautiful. Yeah, it was so cool. We did an orchestra gig. So from what I understand, it was your father who said, Yeah. Here, pick yeah. it back, pick it back up. Yeah. Well, less for him wanting me to find my passion again and more for us to connect again. Oh. And be, I, as, a, as a dad, there are things that you do individually with each of your kids That's right. that are special between you two. And it's a way for you guys to communicate no matter what's happening. Well, Denise often says, and she said it as they were growing up, they're so different. She said, we need to be a student of our children Yeah. because each one is different and they need something from us that's a little different. So mm -hmm. I totally understand. Yeah. So my dad's communication was always growing up was always a little difficult because he had a very difficult childhood. Yeah. And so he didn't want he didn't want that to affect us. Right. And so his way of protecting us was to distance himself. He would be there and he would watch us play games, but he wouldn't join in the game because he didn't want to ruin mm. the fun. And so um, we had to break that wall down. And now that, that wall is gone. But our way before we could really communicate was we would play guitar together. That was his way of communicating love. And so he missed it. He missed playing mm. guitar with his girl. Yeah, And it's beautiful. for him, at the same time that I was losing my hearing, his dad passed away. So we were both kind of struggling with our own sadness. Mm -hmm. So he didn't want to talk. He just wanted to sit and play guitar with his girl. So he asked me to play. Yeah. And I didn't want to, but I said yes, because he's my dad. Right. And uh, it was a moment that should have been basic, but it ended up being a really significant one. And I have to pry. Like, yeah. It, it was significant. How? Well, like, what, what was it that this, created? Yeah. Because for those of you that are going to listen and watch, beautiful voice, 
incredible musician, a songwriter. What happened through the fingers and the mind and the body and the ears or the reception that allowed you to connect again with music and pitch and sound? I mean, so it started with something so simple. I was holding on to the guitar and I was watching him. We were playing, I think, Can't You See, three chords over and over and over again. So I could follow along pretty easily right. and just play rhythm while he does random stuff. Um, he's a much better guitarist than me. <laughs> so I'm, I'm playing rhythm. I haven't played in a while because I just abandoned I'm that sure. stuff. So I'm starting to hurt, right. you know? The, yeah, the, the calluses string, are gone. The strings are cutting in and um, so I'm, I'm kind of mad, but I'm playing them. And uh, I start paying attention to the pain that my fingers are having. <laughs> and then I start focusing on my fingers really hard. And I was noticing I could feel the vibration of the sound that I was making. Because you can. Like, if you put your hand on the table and mm -hmm. you knock, you can feel yourself knocking onto the table. Right. Um, and so then I was like, hmm, well, at least I'm making noise. And then I'm holding on to this instrument and I can feel the noise that I'm making rumbling on my chest on down my arm and into my thumb as I'm creating noise and it was as simple as understanding that the noise still existed that it didn't disappear just because I couldn't hear it and process the information the same I had the ability to appreciate it in a different way yeah and so it was kind of like a, hmm, curious, well, curious what could happen with this. You know I traveled in a sign language and drama yeah. group. And our first performance was at a deaf camp. Yeah. And they responded wonderfully. Yeah. Because they could, I have a big voice. They could feel my voice. And it was actually one of the more powerful moments of my life uh, yeah. to feel the appreciation from this community yeah. but how that translated into pitch well that was a whole different bag of chips right, right. <laughs> but you know the first part of it, it it starts the same it's an understanding that what the world had told me was true about my abilities or now disabilities were just not true, you know? You're put in a box and labeled, this is what you can do, this is what you can't do. And you get to a point where you kind of digest that information again and again and again, so you don't test it. You right. just believe it's true. Yeah. You know, if you're told you cannot climb that mountain by everybody around you, you will start to believe that That's you cannot impossible. climb that mountain. And then it takes one moment for a person to be like, I might not be able to climb that mountain, but I bet I could get up. I bet I could get here. And then once that cracks, you have people who try to find ways to make it work or fail trying. Right. But at least you tried. And so and there's always an outlier that Yeah. You say no and they take that as the challenge. Right. But I didn't have the, the, the I didn't have the right. gumption. I was broken Mandy, you know, devastated. Yeah. <laughs> barely hobbling along you know <laughs> let's go um but so dad was playing with me and we're we're making music blah 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 and then he's like well why don't you try to learn a song sing it which he said and then you could see kind of in his face like he wanted to take it back because mm -hmm. he kind of forgot for a moment you know wow um but i had said sure as a joke, um, back to him. And then I thought about it and I was like, eh, I got nothing to do tomorrow. Why not fail miserably? Um, and my sister found a song that she had heard on the radio she really liked um, called Come Home by One Republic. Yeah. And it's in the key of C. And the guy found the sheet music for it. And I had the entire day alone, no witnesses. I could just be weird. Um, and I found this guitar tuner 
which only has six lights because there's only six strings and That's so right. they're red if you're wrong and then they turn green if you're right so yeah one of those is a c and so i'm just yelling into this device like making <laughs> until something lit up and then i isolated it and i was like okay i didn't hit a c but this is green so i know that is something and so if wow. i have a g how many half steps is it to go up or down till I get to a C? And so I just used all of like this music theory that I had been studying since I was four. Yeah. And the biggest downfall of my career ended up being the biggest aid of my life. Wow. <laughs> and it was it was. But that awesome. I actually can identify with. Yeah. The 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 tuning. Yeah. that we use is so accurate. Yeah. It's not a, you know, a, well, at least I wasn't flat. I was sharp. It's, there's one, there's the note. Yeah. Either direction is off. Right. But there are intervals between notes. Sure. Wow. And if you know, if you know your scales and if you know that stuff, you can painfully I'm, I'm uh, sure. work your way through it. So what I did is I, I sat and I had a mirror and a marker and so I was singing and I was marking on the mirror so that I could remind myself of how many half steps I put all the letters out so I didn't have to guess as much or have to think through the math. Um, as if you find this, but you need here, like, okay, gotta work my way down. Um, and then as I was singing them again and again and again, I would try to close my eyes and sing them, open my eyes, mess something up, I have to find it again, do, do, do okay, I kept it. And then from there, you start kind of feeling how the vibrations move. Mm -hmm. When you're singing things that are low, they rumble deeper in your chest. Right. And when you're singing things that are higher, you can feel it more in your nose. And you have breaks in your voice. So from where you go from chest voice to head voice, it's a note. That's and it's right. different for everybody, but it's a note. Right. And so it's like if you know where that is and you know what that note is, you have a rel you have a you relative have, point of intersection. One, and you, all wow. you need is one note for sure. And then from there you can do your scale and find anything. That's extraordinary. It's and time consuming. So much time. <laughs> so much time. Wow. It took me so I would sing one note, do find it look at the next note on the sheet music and then toggle between the two and then add another note. And then when I would make a mistake, I'd start the whole song over again. And uh, it took me 10 hours to get through the song once. And we're not talking like perfect, I know what this is supposed right. to sound like because I've never heard a reference to it and I didn't have a metronome, so I'm just guessing and the vibe, I have no idea. I'm just singing right. notes. I didn't even put words, I was just singing notes. 10 hours. And then from there, I had, my dad came home and then I sang it for him. He kind of solidified the beat. I was like, oh, okay, this makes sense now. And then I just had this option where I, I could care or I've already lost everything. What's the worst that could happen? Mm -hmm. And I let go. I just stopped caring. And I closed my eyes and sang. I opened my eyes. My dad was crying. I thought it was because it was so bad. Um, <laughs> I broke my dad. And he was like, we got to record it. So we had a little home recorder. We recorded yeah. it so that I could prove it to somebody else and share it with my, my vocal coach because he's my dad. I just can't believe your parents. Your parents love you too much, to be honest. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. That's, that's beautiful, though. Yeah. Yeah. And so that started your journey of rediscovering yeah. music Everything. and pitch and Everything. rhythm. And I mean, and, but people forget, you know, how much work it is just to have a conversation like we're having right now. Like, talking is not something that is easy to do when you cannot hear yourself. Um, it's thought in every syllable it's thought. And I think 
part of the reason why it's so difficult to simcom is because you're thinking of too many things at the same time because you're trying to sign in one language speak in another language and then think phonetically where is my tongue pressing against my teeth to make sure that i'm making a k -k sound versus a s -s sound versus you know it's just so much work yeah and the singing part finding the notes i find to be a little bit easier than actually making words wow so that's incredible it's that's a lot of work that yeah. that people don't understand and probably will never fully like appreciate but i don't do the work for the appreciation i, right. I do the work because it needs to get done yeah and it was and is your calling yeah so so you start working on it yeah. long before a tv moment yeah which kind of brought you to a greater level of exposure and and your journey yeah a greater le level of exposure you were already touring you were already right. active that's how denise met you yeah you were already out there so yeah. how long did it take from that moment to you being in front of people singing and performing um so that was i would say fall of 2008 when i started i think um i ended up meeting up with my old vocal coach and she was like when did you record this i was like yesterday she was like i don't believe you you have to start taking voice lessons again and i was like oh <laughs> of course um and so she's like, well, what do you want to sing? I said, I don't like singing opera. I want to sing jazz. And she's like, okay, uh, you're going to sing live at a jazz club. And so it was always somebody pushed me to do something. My dad pushed me to play. And then my sister pushed me to learn that song. And then my vocal coach, Cynthia, pushed me to sing at Jay's. And then from there, the owner was like, hey, can you come back on Thursday? I said yes, and then I couldn't take it back, so I came back. Every Thursday I came back. I wasn't it's getting incredible. paid. Um, I was maybe getting enough tips to pay for the gas to get there. Mm -hmm. um, and then I was asked by a couple if I would record Were you album. telling people mm -mm. that you were deaf? Uh, I mean, I was signing and singing. Mm -hmm. um, but it wasn't something that we talked about because I was in the background. This is people are eating and dinner like I'm just singing and no one knows who I am. No one knows my name, um, but they like they like my voice. They, so they come back on Thursdays to see to see Mandy sing and then kind of whispers in the night. I love the fact that you did it without talking about the obstacle. Yeah, because that wasn't the goal. The goal was to work through the fear uh, and Amazing. actually get through the song. Like I was focused on trying to do my job. <laughs> um, but people started to figure it out. Um, and then people would, people would talk to each other. Like I didn't have to explain things. Other people would talk to right. each other. I'm sure. Yeah. And then, um, so this couple asked me to record an album. So I did called smile, which was just a collection of songs. I was performing at Jay's at the time. And I was like, it's proof if later something bad happens and I can't figure out. I know that I did it once. Right. So I can figure it out again, maybe mm -hmm. a different path. Um, and then somebody asked me to start talking about my story. And that kind of opened that door. So I think the reason why I ended up meeting Denise was through a friend of mine uh, through not impossible labs or no yes. barriers yeah i think um, they they hosted that event yeah yeah um not not impossible labs and i knew them through no barriers and so i met you no know, the no barriers people at jay's because i was singing there and uh one of the guys who was there his name is eric weinmeyer he's the first man to climb mount everest and he's blind uh, first blind man to climb Mount Everest, not the first man to climb Everest. He would be really old. <laughs> yes. Eric, you're really old. Um, no, but blind. But yeah, he blind. climbed to the top. There's been more than one. There's been, I think, two. It's blind incredible. Climb Crazy. 
but he, he was the one who pushed me to start talking more about what we're talking about now, which yeah. is stuff at the time was too painful to talk about, didn't want to, didn't right. find it beneficial. Here, here's the nasty parts of my life. Enjoy. You know, like right. there wasn't hope to it then. Oh, but there's something powerful about identification. Yeah. I can relate to you. Yeah. And, and even though I didn't lose hearing, I can relate to a journey. I can relate to difficulty. Yeah, my dad always says that not everybody experiences joy and happiness, but everybody experiences pain and loss. And so it's like the one thing that connects us all. Yeah. Um, which is harsh and sad, but it's the truth. And, it, and it's a gentle reminder that no matter how different we might be, um, we're connected in a way because we yeah. both experience something oh, that we can absolutely. understand. Um, you inspire me. Like, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I feel like I've done a lot in my life uh, and been able to achieve and our family has had some achievements. Yeah, some you, achievement. You really are an unbelievable survival story. Thank you. Uh, but, but the fact that at each of these moments you are being encouraged by yeah. people and that helped unlock the moment. You are trying to do the job. I mean, you didn't just sing. You went to a jazz club. I know. I mean, I'm a vocalist. I wouldn't start at a jazz club. Well, again, like, I, it's like <laughs> you get pushed into doing things and I'm a people pleaser. Um, and I don't know why I did it. I, I got to a point where I had nothing left to lose. And I was desperate to mm -hmm. figure out who I was. And if this is a way for me to stop being angry, um, then I need to try it. Because I was so angry all the time. I was so angry, even when I started touring. Yeah. And then I would tell my story and people would be like, oh my God, that's amazing. And I would be like, inside, I'd be like, I am a husk of a human being. You know, because, yes, the story is amazing for you. Right. For yeah. me. I'm living it. I got to wake up and do this crap again tomorrow. You know, like, yeah. uh, I have to figure out how to have a conversation. I have to deal with being afraid of the dark because I can't hear people coming up behind me anymore. I have to feel scared in my house that it's going to burn down because I can't hear the fire alarms going off. I have to deal with people being jerks because they don't want or understand an invisible disability because they can't see it and touch it and understand it, squish right. it around. It can't be real, so you have to be faking it or lying. Or if they believe you, you're using your disability for gain, for oh. status, for pity, for anything, for money. So you have and these constant battles. And you're, then you have- You're these, living in between- Different worlds. The, the hearing world, the- you know, hearing meaning thinking hearing, like yeah, a, yeah, 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 thinking like a hearing person, exactly. Deaf, but hearing impaired. Which all community? They all have their own preferences. Well, and everybody's experience is so different. I would never, ever say that I am a representation of the deaf community, because there is right. no representation of the deaf community. It's a collaboration of. Of differences, you have. You know, our who's... world today understands that there, you're somewhere on a scale. It's a spectrum. Yeah. It's a spectrum. But it is interesting that very few people realize the same thing applies to hearing or loss of hearing. Yeah. Well, it's, so this is this is one of the interesting things that I found is um, when I first lost my hearing, I was, I was at school, and so they put me into like an ASL club, and there was a girl there who, she was um, capital D, deaf, family, deaf, long history, deaf, very proud, mm -hmm. um, but I very traveled angry. I with the same. Yeah, she, she specifically was very angry, and so she didn't want me there because I wasn't deaf enough. Mm -hmm. And that was my first experience with the deaf community. And it wasn't an accurate one for the overall feelings oh, that I, I was going to experience. I would try to sign and my now deaf friend 
would turn away. Yeah, so you've, you've got these, these barriers. And so I thought, okay, deaf world, hearing world, I'm on an island by myself. Mm-hmm. And then later, I met a lot of people who are latent deaf, and they always felt like they were on an island to themselves. I was like, okay, so there's deaf, there's hearing, and then there's the islanders, the people who don't fit in. And then I started hanging out more and more with people in the deaf community. We can canoe to each other. But all of these people in the deaf world, they don't feel like they're always a part of the deaf world either. That's right. So it's like everybody feels like they're floating around on an island. And it's like... See, I learned more from that person, the deaf person, when we broke through yeah the wall yeah uh that that separated the community yeah and it's it's tough yeah because that perspective for that person their experiences it's just that it's their experiences and their perspective and there's so many people and there's reasons why people get upset about things like i know that there have been people who become very angry with me because one i talk Mm -hmm. um I've always talked. Before I lost my hearing, I talked. So for me, it's very normal to talk. It's a lot of work, but it's very normal for me to help us communicate by talking for you. Right. Um, other people might get and hurt thank by you. that. Yeah, but <laughs> there are people who would get hurt by that. Right. And I understand, because I've had conversations, I understand the pain, and I understand reasons, and I can respect that without it being how I choose to live my life. Right. And that's difficult because you're either feeling like you're walking on eggshells mm-hmm. or you know that you're hurting somebody's feelings but you have to keep moving forward. And I hate hurting people's feelings. But I mm-hmm. have to keep moving forward. And, um, but back to when you were talking about cancer and your journey Mm -hmm. and the things that you learned and how you changed and how now you're more empathetic to people who have chronic illness and pain. I think anytime you have these massive barriers that you smack into and then you have to figure them out, you learn so much, you change so much. And I change so much. Like I'm not afraid to sing in front of people anymore. Because what's the worst that can happen? My biggest fear and my identity already had been destroyed. I built that back up again. Who cares? You cannot take anything from me that I'm not willing to give you. Yeah. So it's okay. And if I'm going to make a fool of myself, then I'm going to make a fool of myself. I'm the only one who has to laugh. I can laugh at myself. I'm okay with it. And I've messed up on stage so many times. I did a Christmas show and I was singing Silver Bells. How many times have you sung that song? Like, I, yeah. it's, it's, a, it's in your DNA, the, like right. the Christmas da, trees. Da, da. Yeah. And so I forgot the words to the verse. And I'm standing there, and because now I'm nervous, I forgot the notes. So I was just like, yeah, I'm sorry, guys, it's gone. And there's nothing that they can do to, like, help me know. It's not like they can whistle it for me so we can hear it, so I can, like, oh, yeah, that's right. But... So I See, waited, then they took over, and then the, the audience sang it for that. me. Oh, that's wonderful. But it was, a, it was a moment of real, where we got to connect. Yeah. I've become a lot more strong, I've become a lot more empathetic, I've become a lot more patient, and I'm not afraid to sing. And I always was afraid to sing, because I was judgmental of myself. Yeah. And I criticized myself to death. And so it's just like, this has been one of the best, most beautiful blessings I've ever had in my life. Yeah. To have gone through That's so such amazing. a trial and tribulation. But it's you are amazing. such a, a survivor. Um, and that ultimately that led to America's Got Talent, where yeah. the world really did realize that you are incredibly special. Mm-hmm. Uh, I didn't actually want to concentrate on that. Yeah. I wanted to concentrate on what built you. Care. Because that person is fierce. Still sensitive. Yeah. But that person is fierce. And I wanted these folks, if you have not seen her audition for America's Got Talent, one of their most viral moments, yeah. 
one of the most memorable of, of their entire uh, TV history. Uh, that says so much about your journey. But that, that's a celebration of your hard work, yeah. your survival, your anger overcome, yeah. and the hard work, and now you travel the world. Yeah. And but the, the goal stayed the same from AGT. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they, I think that's probably one of the things I'm more proud of is that AGT was an opportunity for people to give me attention, which is not my focus. Mm-hmm. My focus was always on other people. I didn't mm-hmm. like the attention. Yeah. So when I did the audition for AGT, my goal was to start one conversation or to challenge one person or to give one person a smile or hope. Yeah. Past that, I didn't, I didn't care. Right. And through that journey, and everything that's happened afterwards, the goal is the same. I want people to find themselves to be challenged, to understand that the barriers that they're facing are real, and there's nothing wrong with struggling. There's nothing wrong with having a bad day, that it's something that we can connect with, and together we can break it down, and we can move forward one way or another. It might not look the way that we wanted it to, but we can do it. That's wonderful. I encourage you all. I will revisit this discussion. But I encourage you. Go look at her audition for America's Got Talent. Find her music that we are fortunate to have been a part of. And encourage her message by streaming and supporting her music. This is one of the best musician, vocalist, inspirations in the business today. I can wake up, clear my throat, hopefully no nasal issues, and I can (laughs) sing. What you go through to give us all the wonderful things you give us, it's worth supporting. Uh, And and just truly, um, I went from impossible to inspired and continue to be that. Um, This is The Legendary Podcast. We will have Mandy on when you come to visit us in Las Vegas. Yes. We'll have Mandy on and have her sing some original songs, and we'll make it special, and you'll get to hear even more and see even more. But uh, please do support her. Where can they find you? Oh, you could find me anywhere. Um, MandyHarveyMusic.com, but Spotify, Instagram's all Mandy Harvey. I'm out there. Yeah. Go find her. Yeah. Find her music. Support her because we support her. Mm. She's part of our family. And I encourage you also, please do follow us. Please do subscribe where that happens. Mm. Share with others. Uh, We've been receiving some amazing messages. I expect we will hear some amazing feedback from today. (laughs) Uh, And I encourage you, please, let other people know about us. Leave us some comments, and we'll see you next time. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.